morning church and welcome to worship. I am so glad you are here. I'm so glad you clicked the link. I'm so glad you are gathering together uh, to be a body of Christ to grow in our love of God and neighbor through the act of worship. So welcome, welcome, welcome to worship friends. To let us know that you are here and to let us know how we can connect with you and how can we be praying for you, uh, please fill out our virtual and digital connect card. We'll show a QR code that will take you to that form. Even if you've worshiped with us uh, every Sunday uh, for four years or this is your first time, please let us know how we can connect with you. Please let us know you are here. I also invite you to please visit our church's giving page and give generously and joyfully as we continue to band together to pool our resources to do the work of the church and the body of Christ. We'll show a QR code that will take you to our giving page. And we also have a text to give option, which we'll make sure to post as well. Well, church, last week we finished a three-week sermon series all about suffering. We read through the book of Job together and considered our own suffering and the suffering of those around us and how we respond to it and process that suffering as people of faith. That is really important work, especially as we are in the midst of suffering, not just from quarantine and from being separated from each other due to this global pandemic, but also in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. We are a community that is suffering. We hear the cries of those who are suffering. And it is important for us to ask ourselves, what can we do and how can people of faith respond to these issues and these problems and this sin that exists in the world? So we're going to be doing something a little different this week and next week. For two weeks, we are going to be putting aside our normal order of worship so that we can sit and listen. Listen to the voices of those who have been doing anti-racism work in their communities and in the church. So today I have the pleasure of sitting down with my colleague, Reverend Tyler Sit. May what needs to be said be said, and what needs to be heard, may it truly be heard. Amen. Good morning, church, and welcome to worship. We are very, very blessed to be uh, sitting with my colleague, uh, Reverend Tyler Sitt, who is the founding pastor of New City Church in Minneapolis. And we're here to talk about, uh, talk about with him about anti-racism work in the church, what it is, what it looks like, 
um, maybe some what are some preconceived notions or some challenges that we might face and uh, we're just trying to learn some more about it. So welcome, Tyler. Thank you for your time. I'm so glad to be part of this. Thank you. Hello, St. Anthony. Yeah. Well, tell us first just about, um, tell us about your church. Tell us about New City. And, um, and I know that they are founded around um, Ministry of Justice. Uh, so if you could just tell us a little bit more about New City and the work you're doing now. Sure. So um, my friends and I started New City Church uh, two and three quarters years ago. <laughs> we launched Woo! a weekly worship service. Um, so we are um, very grateful for that. New City is a church that focuses on environmental justice, um, which is kind of looking at the intersection between how our environment and how uh, racial justice and the and economy all kind of live together. Um, and uh, this is kind of a spoiler for stuff I'll talk about later, but we're trying to take an intersectional look at justice, meaning looking at how race and gender and sexuality. Come on and now. Like all these things. <laughs> <laughs> turns yeah. out all these all things have to do with each other. What uh, you know? So we're trying to take an intersectional look that also includes the earth. Um, New City Church racially um, reflects the city of Minneapolis almost to this percentage point in terms of um, uh, percentage of white, black, South African American, Latinx, and Asian people. Mm -hmm. uh, we only have one native person and we don't have any like Somali or Ethiopian uh, mm -hmm. demographics, but uh, yeah, we're, we're a pretty diverse group. We're mostly millennials, like 90% okay. millennials, um, mo like probably 50% identify as LGBTQ plus and um, probably 40% of our community doesn't identify as Christian. So okay. a lot of our work is like building theology from the ground up, not taking anything for granted. Wow. That's, a, that's incredible work. Very cool. What has it been? What is, um, tell us about your church. I mean, lately, just in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and, um, what y'all have been talking about, just how, how are you, how are your people? How are you, um, in all yeah. of this? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's really interesting because, um, I mean, George, George Floyd was murdered in the neighborhood where New City Church is. Right. So in your this backyard. like couldn't yeah. be, more up in our face yeah and um like i i used to live at 30th in chicago which is like the, the intersection oh, where yeah. this happened so it's like i mean just personally it's so bizarre to see um uh the new york times post epic pictures of murals that are on the streets featuring shops that you yeah. know so deeply you know so yes. Yes. um yeah so it, that's that's been surreal but ultimately i think like the, the community is in so much um, grief and so much trauma about um, just how the system of policing criminal justice mm -hmm. has continued to fail the residents of my community and yes. uh, the people who are, uh, who are in many cases most needing protection from yes. that. Yeah. So I think that there's been a lot of wrestling at New City about that, mm -hmm. about trying to create space to grieve even as, I mean, almost everyone at New City is pounding pavement in a protest or distributing food or taking care of someone's kids so that they can do this. And, yeah. um, and I'm, I'm really proud of how the community has shown up. Just I, because I feel like this story doesn't get told enough, like yeah. there were some really intense things that happened at, uh, during the George Floyd uprising yeah. that I feel like isn't being reported specifically around white supremacy. Mm. So like um, the residents of Powderhorn got news from credible sources mm -hmm. that white supremacists were planning on moving the, um, the breaking windows and the looting and the fire from Lake Street down into the residential neighborhoods, which Powderhorn is just off of Lake right. Street. And, um, and so like the people automatically organized with each other and in like overnight uh, created networks with each other, methods of communication. Um, uh, families were packing grab bags in case they needed to flee their home. People were prepping their hoses, filling their bathtubs with water. And over that first week, we had people like people at New City Church reporting like finding water bottles full of 
accelerants for people to start fires and piles of rocks for people to throw that like was not put there by anyone right, right. who lived in the neighborhood right and like banners with swastikas painted on them so like i think that new city since its inception has been talking about white supremacy racism how all of these dynamics are in play in our society yeah and and now we have like like tangible object lessons Proof, of like, right? yep, yeah. here it is. Like, this is what we're talking about. Like it's real um, and it happens and it's here and it's, right. and it's our problem. It's not It's like literally our, like our property is, yes. is, you know, and, um, yes. and I think that like, um, the reason why I want to start with that is because in, from my perspective, there's an argument that white supremacy is real and is like, something that we need to address and organize with, right? Yeah. Like, this isn't just kind of like... We'll this work wasn't done in thing. the 60s? Is that what you're right. saying? <laughs> yeah, no right. way. It, like, it wasn't done in the 60s. It yeah. wasn't done when Obama got president, became president. Like, this is like, yeah. a, a, like, a, like a militarized force. Like, we have to reckon yeah. with that. And we have to reckon with how our life as a church addresses that. Yes. Um, but also, like, we have to reckon with how even if we're not burning down businesses of color, mm -hmm. like ways that American citizens, especially white American citizens are complicit in creating yes. situations where that's possible. Right? Yes. Yes. And can just kind of look over it and assume that any instance is, you know, one bad guy. Well, it's one, you know, right, right. And not see that this is a systemic problem that has been around exactly. for hundreds of years you know yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well i'm wondering what um do you think that would be if i was gonna well one of my interview questions is oh. what do you think some of the biggest misconceptions are about like anti-racism work mm -hmm. the need to do that especially work in the church um and i think we've already kind of touched on one of those one of the biggest misconceptions is that you know we, we are free we are all um everything is fine that racism yeah. doesn't exist anymore <laughs> right. uh and and everyone should just get over it right right and i think that a lot of that robin d'angelo talks about this like a lot of that is from the association of racism with personal guilt like sure well i didn't burn down a uh, black business or i didn't paint a swastika in my backyard right so how could I be racist if I'm not taking these actions? Yes. And I think that as Christians, we're always looking at not just behaviors, but also the idea, like the yes. ideology grounding those behaviors. Yeah. Yep. And that's kind of where we get into where mm -hmm. racism is like just the waters that we're swimming in. Yes. And I think there's something to say about um, knowing that a, a passive role in this is maybe has never been but is certainly not now kind of an acceptable moving forward track um that kind of silence and just we're going to go with the flow and i'm going to be a good person and and leave it at that go go on as normal um that is being complicit uh within yeah. within a systemic issue yeah. yeah 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 like um in the book that i'm writing which those post-it notes over here are me trying to write a book um one of the th one of the things i talk about is like you know, like you know those um moving walkways in an airport yes. and it's like racism is a moving walkway mm -hmm. and it, like if you're walking towards white supremacy that's racist yep. but also if you're standing still on a moving walkway you're still moving towards racism yes. and white supremacy. Yes. So like the, and it doesn't matter if you're standing still and using the right words or if you're standing still and, and like all the right things on social media, listen to the right and songs. you've got all like, the black friends, right? Have all, <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> yeah, like there's a black person living down from your street that waves right. to you. Like right. that is still on the moving walkway. Yeah. The only way to, that we're actually going to see change is if, we repent if we turn yes. and mm -hmm. actively move in the other direction. Yes. I think there are lots of ties between what we're saying about and what you're saying about anti-racism and that you need to be kind of walking and moving and kind of doing that active work. We see ties with that within a Christian community, right? We talk all the time about being intentional about growing in your faith, that that worship, you know, worship shouldn't just be a, a 
box to check, but it's something that we do and searching scripture and, and communing with one another and serving within our communities, um, that these are the, the active ways that we can kind of grow in our faith. And I think anti-racism um, would be a very similar, you could, you could say very similar things, kind of how are we actively growing into anti-racist? Um, how are we, yeah, yeah. Um, so wondering how, how you would see kind of the, the, the ties between a call to follow Christ and to grow in your faith and then a call to do that perpetual work of anti-racism. Yeah. So, um, so first off, I just really want to, um, uh, really endorse the observation that you just made about like, um, the whole like Methodist angle is that grace is something that God sends us before we were born and after we die. Like grace is a perpetual thing that God is like breathing into us. Yes. So when we decide to be a Christian and, and when we are baptized, like those are important moments, mm -hmm. but there is so much work that we have left to do in our faith yes. work that it's going to take our whole lives. And I think that um, that's because God is trying to heal things that are like foundational to, to like wounds that are foundational to our being yeah. and leaning into that healing is something that's going to take a long time. Yeah. And I think that similarly, like healing our society especially like American society was founded upon slavery and indigenous genocide and fear of immigrants. Yes. So, <laughs> yep. well, like, no. <laughs> like that is like the soul of America is, is going to perpetually need like more and more grace yes. that uh, like we need to like push for. Right. Yes. Um, the other thing I was going to say is like Methodists really have a strong belief in um the Imago Dei, the core belovedness of God. Like while we were yet sinners, God still loved us. Yep. Prevenient grace, like before we decided or didn't decide to follow God, God was following us. Mm -hmm. And like that is so core to anti-racism work because unless you start with a foundation of like, I'm okay and the, um, uh, no matter what I need to apologize for or mm. change, or no matter how I was complicit or wrong in a situation, that doesn't strike at my belovedness from God. Yeah. And like the more we can get in touch with that, the more we can ground ourselves in how beloved we are, the more we can go out on a limb and say, I was completely wrong and I need to change. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's that confession, repentance, uh, mm. and remember that you're forgiven and loved, you know, they always mm. go together because mm. I don't think we can do repentance and confession authentically and truly without knowing that we, that God's catching us, you know, in it and God's holding us in it and God loves yes. us in it. So yes, yes, absolutely. yes, yes. So I'm wondering, um, what, so Centennial, we've got energy around anti-racism work. I've got a lot of, I've been talking to a lot of people who, who want to do this work for real and dig deep. We've started to read a couple books. Um, we're, we're talking to you. We'll be talking to uh, Pastor Sean Moore next week. Um, but I'm also wondering, I mean, it's really easy to say, okay, this is an issue, so we're going to read a book, and then we leave better people for it. Um, but I, but what does like sustained anti-racism ministry, what has that looked like in ministry settings where you've been? Um, and maybe that can kind of give us, help us kind of come, come up with some ideas about what this could look like for us. Long -term. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, um, I'm pro books. I'm a big fan of books. I like reading. Great. Me too. Like books right? are yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> I, th I think that, um, uh, Methodists are people of action as well as inward piety, right? And so um, for as many minutes as we dedicate to reading about racism, we should also be dedicating to moving and acting against racism. Yes. So um, that might look like a couple things. I'll just throw out a couple ideas. Please. Yes. So um, one of them is like New City has really benefited from caucus spaces, which mm -hmm. is um, having dedicated spaces for people of color to meet with other people of color and white folks to meet with other white folks sure. to talk specifically about anti-racism work. Hmm. And the reason why that's important is because um, 
uh, sometimes those groups have, have things to say that need to be said and need to be explored, but doing it in the presence of, uh, uh, of racial difference is like part of, it, it, it could cause rewounding. So for example, um, we have people from lots of different education levels come to New City Church. Sure. And, people, and the white folks who come to New City are like, I didn't get a master's degree in critical race theory. <laughs> so like, how am I supposed to, like, this seems so intimidating and you all are yes. talking about this like so far ahead. And I think that a, the white caucus space at New City is a place where white folks can, can say like, I have a question and I don't know why it's offensive, but I think it might be offensive. <laughs> and I just kind of need to like talk about it. Yes. And as a church yep. community grounded in belovedness, we say yep. like, um, we want you to ask questions. We want right. you to be able to air things that are on your mind. Yes. Like racism isn't about walking on, or anti-racism isn't about walking on eggshells or feeling like flagellation bad yes. about yourself all the time. Yep. It's about growth. Right. And we grow when we can speak honestly. And, mm. um, and sometimes when white folks speak honestly about where they are about racism, it can be re-wounding to people of color, especially yes. black folks, because, yep. for example, um, in, in George Floyd, like following George Floyd, like we want white folks to be like, whoa, you're telling me that the history of police, even like the history of police in Minneapolis has like disproportionately brutalized the black community. What? Hover? It's like, yeah. wow, that should be like, we want that realization to happen. Yes. Also a black person who has been through like generational trauma of this yep. is not comforted by someone like just realizing that. That's terrible. Like, that, right. right. Like, yes. yeah, yes. I was trying to tell you that before the whole this became time. a thing. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. like, I think that I really believe in caucus spaces. Mm. And the only way that that works is if we normalize people um, talking about each other and naming that something that you did or said might be racist. Yeah. So again, with the moving walkway metaphor, mm. racist isn't a static category. It's a direction, right? right? So if someone says that something you're doing or saying is racist, that doesn't mean that you as a person are in that category. It means that you're doing something that is causing harm and you right. have an opportunity to repent. Yeah. Um, the metaphor I think of is uh, before all the COVID stuff, I went to a dermatologist and, um, and then after the dermatologist appointment, I got a call from a nurse who was clearly at the end of her shift and was like, Hey, is this Tyler? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. What's up? And she's like, Hey, I just wanted you to know that, um, we removed some uh, some of a mole that you had on your back, and we uh, found out that there was cancer in it. But in removing the mole, all the cancer uh, was taken away, so you're good. And I was like, "What?" And she's like, "Yep. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to us. You have my number. Okay, thanks. Bye." <laughs> and, and, and I felt like, okay, this is kind of what it's like to talk about racism. Because sure. On one hand, it's like, "Whoa, the c word. Like that's a scary word. This is yeah. a really." Yeah. Like, this is serious. Like, we yeah. need to talk about this. Yes. And the nurse is like, we need to get so used to talking about this that it's like, we treat it seriously. And once it's removed, it's removed. And mm -hmm. we don't, like, freak out about it. We don't, right. like, uh, say, like, I must be a bad person and leave the community. Like, right. yeah. wow, that was, like, I just said a racist thing. I'm going to figure out how to apologize and repair that mm -hmm. mole. Like, okay. Mole and then we keep going, you know, right. and, and then we, we just like, there's no one person who can have full awareness of what that looks like. So yeah. we need spaces where people can yes. lovingly call each other back in the community and say, yeah, I don't think this landed how you think it right. was intended to land. Yes. Um, follow up question to that. I know that we have, I've seen, you know, Facebook gets flooded with all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah. And I think uh, there are a lot of like very well meaning, well, God bless the well meaning white folks. Right. Um, <laughs> right. But who, you know, and it, I, I feel like in, um, in groups, it's very easy to then turn to a person of color and say, well, tell me, kind of you take the responsibility for fixing me or for, you know, mm -hmm. um, and the, I imagine the weight of that can be exhausting. 
Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So how, yeah. So I think um, part of this work is also figuring out how to just claim your own stuff and how to claim responsibility over, over yourself and your own learning um, and do so responsibly and still within community, um, but not having it be, you know, we, right. Not having it be, uh, you turn to your one black friend and say, so what should I do? Please you know? fix me. Yeah. Which is, right. I mean, yeah. For like sure. talk about re-traumatizing, right? Like you just experienced like the most, someone who looks like you was just murdered and nothing bad happened yet. And like society's like reacting to it. And then all of a sudden people are like, so tell me how you can fix me instead of the person being like, tell me how I can fix society. <laughs> you know, like that, like the, and I think that that's really the, the power of, having spaces for white folks to be holding each other in relationship mm -hmm. yeah. because um, like all the time white folks are telling me like, so what, what am I supposed to do? Because I know that I'm supposed to like create positions of power or influence or like yield power to people of color. But then what right. do I do with my energy and time? And it's like, yeah, there's a, there's some white folks who you are safe to talk to yes. that are not safe to talk to for people of color. Yeah. And it's your responsibility to like have loving conversation with those folks yes. so that that doesn't default to the black yeah. person. And like, yeah, one of my, I was talking to someone who was like, before as a white person, I hated being on racist uncle duty, which meant like I kind of had to talk to my racist uncle because like, Oh, Yep. It's, it, which is like so aggravating yep. but then I realized that if I made one of my if I don't take racist uncle duty then one of my friends of color has to take racist uncle duty and they might die from that exchange yep so like that's kind of the options right yeah like, so we have you so you mentioned these caucus groups are there any other ways that um you've seen or experienced kind of churches um really really lean into this work yeah I mean I think um, New City Church talks a lot about the kingdom of God. It's, yes. a, it's, a, it's a topic. Right. You know, it's <laughs> kind of like what your namesake. <laughs> we are literally named the New City because of that. And, um, and I think that like some people who, can't, who come to New City from church backgrounds are like, mm. so we're talking about anti-racism, but when are we going to talk about the kingdom of God? Mm. it's like haha <laughs> there's the thing <laughs> like what does it mean that our vision of the kingdom of god didn't have anti-racism built into it already mm. like is that not in itself an expression of white supremacy yes that like that's not something that we would have to deal with right um so yeah when we look at revelation 21 22 we see god open up the gates of, first of all heaven comes down to earth people mm. aren't right. up to heaven right like yes. heaven comes down to earth yes so that means what we do to the earth now matters matter <laughs> yeah we're stuck um, with their folks we're kind of so, stuck yeah. with it like god's <laughs> like oh i was kind of staging the earth for a whole thing and now you're like burning it but um yeah so like the kingdom comes down to earth and then all tribes are welcomed in mm. and i think like we have to figure out how our following Jesus prepares us to, to be in a place that when all tribes are welcomed in, we're not killing each other as we're moving towards that. <laughs> and you like mean genocide is not part right. of the kingdom of God. That's so weird. As it that's turns so weird. out. So like, so I, yeah, I think that that's really the, um, the crux of it is like, we need to see we need to name that like the church has a unique thing to offer conversations about anti-racism mm -hmm. like we should absolutely be reading robin d'angelo and resma yeah. mannequin and like these amazing ibram x kendi like yes. all of these are amazing people mm -hmm. and like it's not like the church's only job is to follow what those authors say like right. the church's job is to create a vision of the kingdom of God based mm. off of what they say, but also based off of things that we specialize in spiritual yes. practices, yeah. worship, the sacraments, mm. all of these things are tools for us to like move towards a vision of the kingdom of God yes. where all tribes are truly welcomed in. Amen. 
Amen. Um, would you, what are some, we've kind of been talking about this um, or touching uh, um, about the difference between kind of what I led into the question with, you know, we're reading a book and wanting to make sure that, um, that, that this is not a flash in the pan, that this is something that, that we are saying, this is a part of who we are. This is a part of our following Christ is doing this work. Um, and I'm wondering if there are any other kind of pitfalls you see or even warnings or suggestions you would have about um, creating like really sustained, sustained ministries within the church. Yeah. Yeah. So um, something that New City is really trying to focus on is children. Like mm. how do we talk to kids about racism in developmentally appropriate ways? Yeah. And um, how do we talk to children of color who are, witnessing so much trauma like i mean at, in terms of adverse childhood experiences yeah. like whoa like just turn on the tv and it's right there yeah um and also how do we talk to um white kids how do we form and and support white children such that they're not the ones leaving swastika banners in the in people's you know. back alleys yes. like that's Yes. a really big <laughs> really really big, big thing yeah um so i i really think that that's worth investing in Absolutely. um new city uh started a raising white kids group from, mm -hmm. from parents just being like how do we do this work like <laughs> we yeah. gotta do this better like yes. somehow we gotta do this, you know yes. so i think yes. that that's important um i think that sometimes white people um uh, hear things like white caucus groups and they're like, great, we're going to create like white anti-racism programming where it's like white people talking to white people, which yep. there's certainly a place for. Yep. And like those white spaces need to be accountable to leaders of color, right? Like it's, yep. it's no longer an anti-racist space. If it's like, don't listen to people of color. We know how to do anti-racism, right? So like, yes, like, in terms of like who are you following on social media what are the songs that are being uh and the voices and the stories being incorporated into worship yeah. um what are the the things that you're bringing up with your friends after in fellowship like those mm. are all like what are the images of of people who are in your physical church space yeah like those are all really 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 important for shaping an imagination the thing I, I the last thing I would say is um, the budget is is a sacred document, mm. and like it reflects what we think is important and it reflects oh, what we call we're us out, with. Tyler. You call it. <laughs> do it. You do it. So it's like, yep. If you're like, I really care about anti racism, and then I go to your budget, and I'm like, okay, so like, what on the budget is reflecting anti racist commitment? Yep. And there's nothing. Is that so, I don't really <laughs> so, we're gonna have, we're gonna sit in that beloved space we're going to know our belovedness and we're gonna say okay so how can yes. we now repent and conf confess yes. and repent and make that turn yeah yes and um and so yeah and so that might mean um i i mean i think that you have brilliant genius people in your congregation who can think of really contextual ways to do that Absolutely. but um uh looking uh, like geographically around you like what are businesses of color that we can support? What are um, school systems or programs that support children of color? Yes. Um, what, uh, what are uh, um, discipleship ministries that we can participate in? Like, there's an infinite number of ways to allow your budget to reflect anti-racism mm -hmm. and you're going to make some mistakes on the way. The yes. most important thing is that you just keep trying, make the space in it, you know, like yes. don't wait for the next tragedy for there to be space in your budget for a commitment to yes. racism Yes. Amen. Amen. What do you think are the biggest challenges that that churches could kind of face as we are, you know, we're, we're, we're noticing, we're trying to be active, um, we're trying to do, so what are kind of the biggest, yeah, what, what are kind of the biggest challenges or pitfalls you, um, you see? Yeah. Or maybe some common ones, I guess. Yeah. So, um, like, I grew up Minnesotan, Mm. All the way, like hardcore, a hot dish runs through my veins. That's right. I don't know if the church knows this, but Tyler and I went to high school together. Oh! So we grew up in that same neighborhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eden Prairie all the way. Yeah. And I just, um, um, I think that um, 
the the challenge that I'm seeing in Minnesota is that there's a lot of people who oppose racism and uh, and their beliefs and, and voting habits and all that like reflect that. Mm. And therefore they're um, they have a hard time believing that there's still a problem and that they might be part of it. Yeah. So it so like some of it, I think that there's kind of this like, oh gosh, you know, I didn't, I, I, uh, but I, I shop here and do this and I do this, and so like, therefore, nothing that I say can be <laughs> racist at all, like ever. Okay. Like I'm as if there's like a racist trust fund that yeah. absolves you from spiritual responsibility. Like you're never. You can never just live off of right. your bank of, of yes. social responsibility. So, yes. so that's, and, and that stops becoming a chore when we remember that it's about belovedness and pursuing the kingdom of God. Mm. Like never grow yeah. weary in running yes. the race of faith, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, the second thing I would say is uh, collectivize your actions. Like, I think it's great if you personally find a space in your budget to do anti-racism things Mm -hmm. but the what saint Anthony park as a community can do if Mm -hmm. all of you do that is way bigger so like have a collective imagination about this and the last thing that i would say is um watch out for the um a lot of times i hear people be like uh i hear white people saying like oh i would never do that and mm. kind of like distance themselves from other white people in kind of like a, I'm one of the good whites and then there are bad whites, but I'm yeah. one of the good whites. Mm-hmm. And, it, and like that is just wasted energy and breath. Like, mm. like we know that you think that you are completely immune yeah. from some of the horrifying things that we see in society. Yes. And uh, our, our track record as Minnesota shows that like that belief doesn't stop those things from happening. <laughs> Sure doesn't. So, <laughs> sure doesn't. Yeah. So there, like, I think that um, reclaiming belo- a sense of beloved community and yeah. white folks being like, okay, so that white person is making choices that I don't believe that I would w- make. And like, as a white person, on talking to another white person, mm-hmm. I see us as like, like bound together in this beloved community conversation where somehow we can all move together. And yeah. just approaching it from a sense of, um kinship like yes you know yeah yeah, sometimes we call the kingdom of god the kingdom of god Mm. because we're trying to rediscover our relatedness yes oh thank you those are excellent and finally i mean uh you know there this can be really devastating work but i'm wondering where you find where you find hope in this all um you know i think as i think uh as part of this work there are going to be some really dark nights of the soul um, and wondering, you know, in the midst of that, uh, where, where do you find hope and where do you see hope, um, yeah. right now? I mean, I literally do not understand how people can meaningfully attend to anti-racism work without an, a relationship to a savior. <laughs> mm. And like, I... Um, and I, and I acknowledge that there are lots of people who do. And so I'm not, I'm not slamming anyone, but I'm just saying like having a relationship with Jesus has gotten me really far in this conversation because one, if you truly believe that Jesus is savior, that means that no, none of us are the savior. (laughs) No, none of us have the Mm -hmm. the thing to storm in and and solve the thing, right? Right. Like, um, uh, Jesus as a savior means that we can lean and trust that the things that we're facing are difficult and terrible, but the depth of that terribleness is not greater than the love of God. Mm. And the love of God is going to, is what is going to carry us through. And like, that's just it. Like Jesus is like, this is pretty much decided folks like love, like God's love has already decided all the things that you need to decide. Like the cross death and resurrection show that the worst that Mm. humanity can come up with is a drop in the bucket in comparison to the endless torrent of God's love. And if we can approach this work as if God has freed, frees, and will free us, Mm. it completely changes how we show up. 
yes, we're already on the winning side, you know? Right. Like, so there you go. Yeah. Ta-da! Like, spoiler alert, God wins. Like, that's it. Who knew, right? And, like, we all did. We all did. We so literally good. all did. And yes. meanwhile, like, we just need to make sure that we don't, like, destroy ourselves in the process. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, anything else, anything you wish I had asked? Any other thoughts that kind of, um, st- that we stirred up? I don't know if I said this in a concise way, but just know that, like, this work is so hard and this work is so worth it. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. Like, yes. Sometimes you're going to get to a point where it feels uncomfortable mm. and, your, and your body won't be able to tell if it's discomfort or pain. Yes. And, and like pain means that something's wrong. Like I'm feeling pain because something is wrong. Yes. Discomfort means that something's hard, yes. but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. Yep. So like, Sometimes you will feel discomfort and think that it's pain, <laughs> but by leaning on community, by leaning on God's grace, yes. you can discover that the discomfort just means that there's something beautiful emerging and, yeah. and, and we're all kind of like mm. midwifing it. So. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that. And thank you for, for uh, this interview. I really, really appreciate it. But all of you, anyone watching, if you, if something that Tyler has said has just sparked something in you, if there is um, either the the caucus idea or um, any sort of active ministry, if you have an idea in your head and you're feeling called and you get that butterfly sensation, like, is it me, Lord? Yes, it is. And you should email me um, and we will talk about how God is calling you to do this work. And we want to be doing this work. We want to be doing this for real. Um, So that's what we keep saying at St. Anthony Park is we want to be the church. We want to do church for real, right? Um, Not just boxes to check, but we are on this journey together and we are here to grow in our love of God and our love of neighbor. And so this anti-racism work is so much um, a part of that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you for your time. And how can we, if we want to um, look into new city stuff, if we want to donate, if we want to um, support y'all, how can we find you? Sure. sure. Um, so uh, we're on social media, New City Church Minneapolis, Grow New City on Instagram. And uh, New City launched a solidarity fund program, which is a program where we're raising money that will go to, one third of it will go to other organizations that are doing work on the street. One third of it will go to microloans in our community to people who have been economically affected. And one third will go to anti-racism programming at New City. Awesome. Well, we'll check that out. But thank you so much for your time, Tyler. I really appreciate it. Blessings. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.
won't shadow, you won't light up Mountain, you won't climb up Coming after me